If you're watching this the day it went out, and I got it out on time, then today's Blue Monday. It's the most depressing day of the year according to science, according in turn to the Daily Mail, who themselves got it from Cliff Arnold, who was paid to put his name to it by a travel agency who wanted to promote themselves. They felt it had to have a, an air of academic credibility to it, so they reached out to Arnold, who is Cardiff University's, and let's get this title right because the university does insist, former part-time tutor. The idea is that we've all been back at work for a couple of weeks, the weather's still a bit rubbish, we've largely given up on our New Year's resolutions, and there aren't any bank holidays coming up for a while. That's why it's never caught on in America, because the date Arnold picked was the 3rd Monday of January, which is the same thing as Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and no one in America is at work. In Britain, though, Blue Monday is so depressing that the only thing you can do about it is to book a holiday with Sky Travel in particular. And the idea was so successful that over the next few years, lots of other companies jumped on the bandwagon and started using it to promote their products as well. And this kind of continued until the British press lost interest in stories that start in scientists have found a formula for the perfect sandwich hot dog cup of tea and started doing spurious surveys instead with deliberately provocative results. Part one. Why does this happen? Well, in science, like real science, Equations are a really good way of applying a discovery. It's one thing to understand Newton's laws in words, but if you have equations, you can put numbers in them and work out how much fuel you need in your rocket. Take an example. Everyone, I think, mostly knows that if you wave a magnet around a wire, you can induce a current in it, or that if you have a current moving through a wire, it creates a magnetic field. But the equations that describe these are Maxwell's equations, and they look like this. What was interesting about these is it wasn't until we wrote down stuff that we mostly already knew in this way that Maxwell could look at it and realise there was another solution that no one had spotted to these equations. These equations have a wave solution which suggests that there should be some kind of propagating wave passing through the electric and the magnetic fields. And he worked out how fast that wave should go. And the answer came out at exactly the speed of light which had been already measured using other means. That is how we found out that light is an electromagnetic wave. We got that from waving magnets and wires around each other, writing down some equations, and then solving them. Of course people are going to be interested in scientific equations, and that's what these news stories prey on. Say you have a product that you want to sell, but people don't really know about. You want to get it in the newspaper so that they'll read about it there, but if you buy an advert, first of all it costs you a lot of money, and second of all the people reading the newspaper don't want to read the adverts, they want to skip the adverts and read the news. So how can you get your product in the news? Well, you could make an advert but make it ostentatiously walk so that people cover it, or you could invent a news story. For example, this guy who supposedly got sent a size 1450 slipper by mistake. If you're a company, this is gold. If you're a journalist, this is even better because this means you don't have to do any journalism that day. The only person who loses really is the person reading the newspaper who's been fed a lie in order to sell slippers, but you don't care about that, literally your job is to make that happen. But for a while, the fashionable way of doing this, for some reason, was to invent a story that scientists had discovered the equation for some mundanity of life, such as how to make the perfect pie. Which isn't to say these equations are all garbage. The formula for the perfect parallel parking, for example, was absolutely a PR stunt, but the academic they contacted to make it did the maths properly. It's just Pythagoras theorem applied again and again until you find the length of the smallest parking space that you can fit a particular car into. The kind of next rung down is where you fit a model that you already know and call it an equation. It, it isn't how equations work in science, but it, it is an equation and the things in it are broadly true. It makes accurate predictions, but only because it's engineered to do so. The next rung down is the sort of maths equivalent of those headlines about recipes that start with take a dash of inspiration and 800 grams of courage. It's just a list of the things you need with maths words in between typeset to look like an equation, usually a bit. And yet somehow there's a rung below even that. There's the not even trying rung, where the equation is really just a picture of an equation. It's not referenced. The values in it don't make any sense. The units don't combine. There is no 
maths happening. There's just a picture of some maths and a description of what people might do with the maths were it real. And honestly, you kind of might as well do that if you're playing this game, because first of all, who's actually going to check if it's a real equation? I mean, I am. I'm going to check. I'm going to check it to the point that I was described by the Guardian newspaper as frighteningly anal for doing so quite so rigorously. But also, the newspaper is very likely to either just not print the equation, because it's too complicated for their little readers' heads, or else they'll try to print the equation, but fail. For example, this is the formula for the perfect Christmas present wrapping. It was developed by Dr. Sarah Santos here in Manchester, and it's real, it's correct. It's a really clever way of wrapping presents, but this is not the formula, because this has been typeset so badly it doesn't make any sense. There's a slightly better version in this report, but that's also wrong. And there's a version in the MEN that looks tantalisingly correct, but you actually have to go to a mathematics blog for somebody who's done the legwork and figured out what it's actually supposed to say. Part 2. So this is all fake, then. And at this point, a reasonable question to be asking is, so, who cares what a bunch of equations made up to sell travel insurance say? They're not true. You can just ignore them and be happy whether it's Blue Monday or not. And that's fair enough. But we don't know these equations are false. That would be the genetic fallacy, which says that just because the person telling you something cannot be trusted doesn't mean the statement itself is necessarily false. The scientific test of truth remains. Do these hypotheses make predictions? Are the predictions testable? And if we test them, do they hold up? So let's take as an example this newspaper story that says that scientists have figured out the formula for the perfect relationship. They say that your relationship will remain strong and it will endure if every month you make three romantic gestures, go on two romantic walks, give two romantic gifts, have three home-cooked romantic meals, one breakfast in bed, two dinner dates, seven cosy nights in, one night apart, one trip to the pub, one trip to the cinema, and six proper conversations, whatever that means. It doesn't say whether you're allowed to have a dinner date at a pub that does home-cooked meals and walk there and talk over dinner and like not seven of them out in one evening. It doesn't say you can't do that. More to the point, it doesn't really account for the fact that different months are different lengths. According to this theory, you should per unit time be more romantic in February than you are in any other month. What that means is that, in order to make that happen, we should have some kind of festival of romance around about the middle of February. I like chalk up a win for the equations on this one, then. But that could have been a fluke, so let's take another example just to be sure. Say you want to write a film and you want to have a death scene in your film and you really want that scene to have impact. You could use this formula, which was developed according to the article by a former graduate of King's College London which kind of makes it sound like they took her degree away from her when they saw what she was doing with it. But, I mean, this is real mathematics. I shouldn't have to prove that to you. It has a sine function in it. How much more real mathematics do you want? Sine x is blood and guts. It says so right here in the article. It doesn't say what x is, but I think we can safely infer that x must be this angle here. When, when sine x is high, there's a lot of blood and guts. Which checks out because it's telling us that dead people fall over. But that is not the prediction that I'm claiming for this one. What I want to show you is this. This is a formula for the perfect joke. It was developed by Helen Pilcher and Timandra Harkness to promote their comedy show. And it says that if people fall over, things are funny. And you do not want people laughing all through your death scene. Anything that's long and has lots of people falling over is objectively hilarious, and that's why Infinity War was so successful. So if you want an impactful death scene without people giggling the whole way through it in the cinema, you're going to have to lower this number and make the joke aspect of the scene worse and worse and worse. The easiest way to do that is to add puns. He had lots of guts! We just derived James Bond from first principles using 
supposedly bullshit equations found in newspapers. So I think we've proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is genuine science that we can trust and make predictions and inferences from and use to live our lives. So let's. Part three, salvation. So even though these equations are definitely real and Blue Monday is therefore definitely a real thing and you should definitely feel sad, science hasn't doomed us. The good thing about science is that when it tells us about a problem, it often gives us the solution at the same time. For example, science tells us that the planet is undergoing catastrophic climate change, but it also gives us the ability to come together as a society and pay large oil companies to tell each other that everything is fine. So what can we do to beat Blue Monday? Well, we can use the equation that governs it to find its weak spot and exploit it. Now there's a lot in this equation that can't be changed, the weather for example is pretty fixed and our motivation levels can only be changed by working to better ourselves, which sounds like effort, but we can change D. D is the debt you accumulate over Christmas, and that we've got a handle on. Now remember that our goal is to increase happiness, so the last thing we want to do is ruin Christmas. We just want to make it cheaper. Luckily we have this formula from the Journal of the Daily Mail. This is the highest impact journal that has ever carried these equations, and it tells us how to make Christmas perfect. So as long as we don't affect this value at the end, P chi, it's probably an X isn't it, but let's be generous. As long as we don't affect P chi, we can change any of the other numbers we want, and Christmas will remain perfect. Now the canonical version of this formula that's in the newspaper says you have to have eight family members over and buy each of them four presents totaling £23, play three nice family games, go on two walks, have two glasses of wine, eat three chocolates, have five portions of turkey and one portion of nut roast, all over three days. And mathematically, over three days. This is a fraction. And as all school children and many adults remember, if you divide the top and bottom parts of a fraction by the same number, the value out the other end does not change. So we can keep P chi exactly the same. We can keep Christmas perfect by shrinking it and keeping all the proportions exactly the same. So in the original version, we're spending £23 on each of eight people for a grand total of £184, which is a lot of money. So first thing we can do is, instead of buying each of them four presents, buy them one present, divide top and bottom by four, and the price goes down to £5.75 per person, but that's still potentially quite a lot of money. What if it was £5.75 altogether? If you get rid of seven family members, you can divide top and bottom by eight on top of the four you already did, and now Christmas costs £5.75 altogether. If you've been back at work in January for long enough to get depressed and you haven't earned £6, quit your job! Of course, the problem is, but the other values in the equation all change as well. For example, Christmas now lasts 135 minutes, and if you're thinking that's not long enough to have a nice Christmas, I invite you to observe that the running time of Die Hard is only 132 minutes, proving once and for all it is the perfect Christmas film. I should say there are some problems with this equation. The main one for me is that the letter W appears twice, once it means have a glass of wine, once it means go for a walk, and mathematically that doesn't work. W must by definition equal W, so the only way this works is if wine and walking are in some sense the same. But that, that could be right, because this appeared in the Times in 2010. It's the offset your carbs wall chart. The idea is that it gives you a list of exercises and a list of treats that offset them exactly. The treat contains a number of calories that the exercise burns off, so if you do both it will cancel out. And according to this wall chart, going for a walk equals some garlic bread. Wine, although you can't necessarily make it out on this mid-range smartphone camera picture from 2010, is equal to some sex. And that means that if wine equals sex, and walking equals garlic bread, and wine equals walking, then garlic bread is mathematically equal to sex. And that might sound ridiculous, but how else do you explain the success of Peter Kay? So what does our new 135 minute Christmas look like? Well, it's mostly pretty doable because we've divided everything down by the same amount as we have the time. The main problem is going to be that nut roast was on the denominator for some reason, so you do have to get through 32 portions of that. 
and you only get one sixteenth of a glass of wine to wash it down with. The other slight problem is this term here, it's 3g over 32. g is play a nice family game, and that doesn't immediately obviously divide down by 32. I mean, there is a formula for the perfect family game, obviously there is, but if we divide it by 32, all we get is a game that's not very good. No, what we need is a nice family game that divides exactly by 32. And it might sound like there probably isn't one, but I found it. It's chess. Chess is 32 pieces on 64 spaces. It's perfect. We can take three chess over 32. We can sell it for £5.75. It'll be the perfect present. Chess is a two-player game, which is ideal because we've only invited one family member to Christmas. Three chess over 32 is three pieces on six spaces. And it's perfect for those three minutes between the end of Die Hard and the end of Christmas. Because this is Checkmate.